everyone. <sighs> All right, I think uh, I think the audio is working. Um, yeah, it is. I'll wait for a few people to get in, and there's a few questions that are. From the Patreon from a while back. Um, I planned to do this before Christmas, but never got around to doing it. Um, so yeah, it's a general Q and A for my birthday, which is some point next week. Um, we'll go from there. But if anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask before, uh, yeah, before things get rolling, then put them in the comments and. Uh, see how it goes if not then I'll just answer the ones that uh, so I mean I'll just answer the ones that um, I've got and then while people are coming in so the first one someone asked was, how long is the process of doing research on an author or a book? Doing the episode and launching. So the, the how long is the full process, basically. Um, this is dependent on the episode, on the thinker, whether or not I'm already familiar with the thinker, whether, I'm not, whether or not I'm already familiar with the guest. Um, I would say that if I stick to it and get to it fairly quickly and I'm not having problems reading the content and the turnaround time is about two weeks or maybe two to three weeks so clarify that the guest is up for doing it then read the book which is hopefully fairly average length of course if it's longer that takes a lot a lot longer time and then you know take the notes get them back over to them and then schedule so yeah it's about t normally two to two to four weeks full turnaround time obviously it's longer with certain certain guests certain people who've got busy schedules and longer for I, I do try like to at least understand the topic so it um that can take a that can take a while if i don't know the topic too well um yeah uh, about two to yeah two to four weeks um the next question was do you have a recommendation of the best book for understanding the hermetic tarot symbolism? Um, there's a lot of good books. So Christian Meditations on the Tarot is like my go-to. Obviously, that's what I did the full series on. Um, that's like my go-to tarot book. Um, I think it really helps um, give an understanding of what the tarot is without even going into divination. And then if you want to actually use them, then you can. Um, written obviously by Valentin Tomberg, um, where with a, these days with a foreword by Hans, on, Hans uh, von Balthasar. Um, that's fairly good, but I would also recommend Uspensky's book on the tarot as a fairly good um, starting place. There's also, I'm going to completely blank his name, um, a very, very small, quite literally a small book on the tarot that used to be packaged with the Rider Waite tarot 
um, sets. That's also um, a good a good intro to Tarot. Um, that's pretty much all I'd say about Tarot. I haven't read too widely outside of those. Someone asks my dream guest list. Uh, living people who maybe haven't been available, reachable, or the timing hasn't been right, but you'd love to have them on. Um, my dream guests... My, dream, my absolute dream guest who was never it was never going to happen and he was alive while I was doing this was Cormac McCarthy of course but he's sort of a dream dream guest in the sense that I wouldn't have really had much to say to him at all um, maybe I would have, would have preferred to just have a pint with Cormac McCarthy rather than talk about books or anything like that but he would have been my dream guest and then also like without seeming too edgy I genuinely would have loved to interview Ted Kaczynski before he died to get some to some interview relating to his actual work as opposed to the biographical stuff um, other dream guests there's a lot of spiritual guests that I would like to have on I mean I'd like to have a few of the previous guests that I've had on again who were um, sort of tougher to schedule um, Zizek is sort of a dream guest though I even do have his email but he hasn't replied to me yet it would just be a very fun conversation and one I'd like to have uh, yeah, before he's no longer with us. I think it's getting on a bit now, but no meanness intended there to Zizek, but that would be, he would be a dream guest. Um, there isn't too many others. I don't, I think anyone who I, who I feel I could contact and get on, I would straight away. Um, that hasn't, yeah, usually you're just not going to get a reply from, from people like that who are super, super busy. Um, someone said, have you ever narrated an audio book before? If you want to, could or could, what book would you choose? And they said that some of their favourites were me doing the, the book reviews. Um, if I could do an audio book of anything, it'd probably be Moby Dick, because when I read and when I go back and read bits of Moby Dick, it is something that I love to read out, out loud, especially the, the sort of monologues from Ahab. Um, yeah, I, I would absolutely... Just and when I was reading it out for the book review, I greatly enjoyed that. So I'd love to read. If I could do an audio book of anything, it would be Moby Dick. Whether or not my accent would really work for the book, um, I don't know. I don't know what my accent would work for in in audio book form. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any others. Maybe any any of the sort of the basic westerns like the Virginian or. Um, Riders of the Purple Sage, like a sort of fairly fun western, would be fun to uh, any anything epic as well. I think that's yeah, Moby Dick would be top of my list for audiobook. Um, and someone asked a question which quite a lot of people have been asking me, which might take a little bit of time to explain um, and I have to tread carefully in a way. Someone asked me for an update on my spiritual journey and on Be Not Afraid. Um, so at some point likely later this year I have a book coming out with Aeon books called um, A Call to God A Journey, uh, sorry, An Introduction to spirit to Spiritual Christianity sorry, A Spiritual Introduction to Christianity um, so it's a fairly short book with Aeon with a focus on the actual spiritual practice of what it is to be a Christian and one of the things I tried to do with this book when it comes out um, and obviously when I was writing it, it's from all my time in other spiritual alternative paths. One thing that you that you find as a way to give people that broad foundation when they begin um, and something that I found, to be honest, did find lack, lacking. Um, you'd, anyway, you'd find this in alternative spiritual paths is, is something like a guidebook of a 10, 20 week guide or maybe even a year is a classic one and then you'd get on to year two and year three and of course you know this is a difficult thing to do for a, uh, for any religion but uh, for Christianity it's, it, or uh, many other religions you feel like if you're saying right do this on week one do this on week two do this on week three it comes across as if you're saying well, these are the only things you can do and that's not why I wanted to, to put across but one thing I wanted to emphasize with it that I found lacking was like coming from a Coming from a background where you really, really the, the focus of the spiritual path is, is the actual spiritual practice, um, I found it a bit lacking to suddenly be more involved with things like dogma and, you know, say, 
religious life and um, readings and things like that. Um, my focus has always been more of of the actual the actual practice and what you might call connection with something something greater. So that that book's coming out in terms of where I veered with Christianity. In terms of Catholicism, I get pulled forward and backwards all the time. But one one thing that I want to I guess read reiterate in a way this is is sort of um not necessarily a regret i wouldn't define it as a regret to have made it a public thing um but more so that i should have been a far more i should have been far more patient with my journey and far more sort of uh, perhaps even subtle about it and just allowed it time to breathe as opposed to like jumping in with both feet and declaring things left right and center so you know that's one thing of being uh, someone who is an online figure of sorts I guess is that to tie my personal life you know the, the, my personal life in that sense was somewhat tied up with the podcast because I do all the spiritual stuff on the podcast and spiritual talks and things like that so it's difficult to avoid it if, it if I was going to be mentioning it but um I think that's my advice as well as uh, just to take your time because that's why I didn't really do it it's like right I'm all in everything's going to be this and then uh, yeah you know it's a bumpy ride and you've got to give it time and there's one thing as well that I emphasize in, in the book the, the first of the two books so the second book is going to be the esoteric Christianity book um, focusing on different uh, esoteric Christian figures throughout history written with Aaron French um, from the course that we did but uh, far longer and in book format and the first book is I mean, it really does emphasize that things aren't, you know, things aren't that easy. They aren't, they're, they're fairly up and down and bumpy all the time. So, you know, uh, that, that, that's pretty much where my, and also I'm not as reluctant now to, to draw other things in that I enjoy, uh, that I really got something from before. So now my, you know, very, very roughly my spiritual practice is something akin to like maybe Christianity mixed with Gurdjieff or something like that. But, you know, I've, I have more days than not where it's extremely dark, dry, if not nothing at all, and I find myself reading someone like Spengler and trying to understand my place in the world as someone who has been born within this temporal context. Um, and that's the difficulty, I think, at the moment in terms of a lot of people have asked me about my spiritual journey, and it's coming to terms with, at some point, feeling the need for a spirituality, feeling the need for that that extra thing. And then also finding a balance between that and the f and the fact which it is a fact that that i am and we are people alive today are modern human beings even if we don't particularly identify with you know, the the pastimes of modernity we are modern beings with a historical mindset with a quantified mindset we aren't in an age of faith anymore we have these like relics of faith that we can look at and and reach to but um other than that it's that difficult transition period between the two eras that that is uh, very tough to sort of come to come to terms with, uh, especially consistently. Um, yeah, someone asks in the chat, happy birthday, thank you. Uh, are there any topics or hobbies you've had an interest in doing a podcast on, but it's too far outside of the normal scope? There's been a lot, actually, because since I've picked up this as a, a skill and I can sort of do it fairly smoothly now, there's a lot of things I think, oh, you know, that would be fun to create something around but I also know how much effort it is and I also know that as much as I still love philosophy and love spirituality and love all the things I talk about it's taken a tiny amount of the you do at least to a certain degree have to be a bit more bureaucratic about it and read things in a certain way and talk about things in a certain way so it's not necessarily that it kills the love or or smothers the enjoyment but it's it's you know akin to if someone who um, was teaching philosophy for instance they're now going to have a different relationship with philosophy that they did when they were just a student or just reading it for enjoyment so you know there the, the main one and i don't even mean this as a joke the main one that i would like to do is like a history of snooker uh pod, podcast or something along those lines because i adore snooker more than more than a lot of things and just be able to talk about snooker and maybe you know wangle my way into becoming a snooker commentator would be uh would be good um other than that, I think there's now conversations. So earlier on, earlier on in the days of the podcast, I would talk to guests that were um, a little less known, perhaps a little more radical, a little more crazy. And I miss those kind of conversations in a way, and it's tough now to gauge what 
what where the where the line is with them um so maybe a podcast like a like a tangential podcast that has more of those radical crazy conversations with theories that aren't as necessarily you know academically rigorous or whatever it might be um that you know that would be more fun i always at one point i did play around with the idea of like a theory fiction podcast which was set in the like set in the past like a radio show from the past that's fragmented in time and sort of a fictional um what do you call it serialized podcast along those lines but it takes a lot to get enough people to sort of uh, together to to organize these things um so that was a yeah those are ideas uh that i had outside of that what other hobbies do i have i mean maybe maybe like you know i do the book reviews now maybe more a more fiction novel focused one but i think that's finding its way into hermetics pretty naturally so that that's that's fine um if anyone else has got any other questions please let me know in the chat um those were all the ones from i didn't there wasn't too many in the q a response before christmas um so there was only those five before christmas so if anyone has any other questions they'd like to ask um but while i wait for if there's any other questions um i'm just trying to think what's what's coming up so we've got the chat on nihilism is coming up another chat with jason horsley is which we recorded today which was very good um is going to be live at some point in the next month there is um let me get my calendar there is a chat on um alchemy that i'm recording next week with Brian Cotnoir, I believe his name is pronounced, uh, which I'm excited about. Um, his books on alchemy seem to be the go-to books on alchemy these days and really accessible um, and really fun to read and also has that practical element which moves away from the current sort of psychological, psycho-spiritual climate of understanding alchemy actually more so as a spiritual thing, as a, as a, um, like a psychological al alchemy internal refining alchemy uh, and it has that practical emphasis of you know quite literally alchemy so i'm excited for that um and then also next week chatting to jay garfield again about his book um his latest book about the self so the fact we don't have a self and the difference between self and person um and jay was really fun to talk to last time so i'm looking forward to that and then speaking to aaron french again about jacob burma um mystical christian fairly overlooked not too well known so excited for that and then um the week after that um john michael greer is starting to do podcasts again so me and uh, greer have two podcasts lined up the first one's booked in uh first one's on the kabbalah uh so just be talking to him about the kabbalah and then the second one is on um uh, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. So two things that he knows a lot about and that we could chat about and have a fun time. Um, outside of that, still a fair bit actually planned. There's, I've got a little bit more reading to do on Ser, on Hermes. Um, the, the, the recently released first volume translation of Ser's Hermes. And then um, a book on weird mysticism with Charon and sort of yeah Charon and weird uh, weird sort of pessimistic mysticism that's by Baumgartner and there is a few others that I've got so much on um, Tim Howes hopefully in a yeah, that's a, this is way off because someone was asking how much I prepare for an episode and I hadn't read any William Golding and, and Tim Howes has been reading a lot of William Golding uh, lately um, asked if I wanted to do an episode. I haven't read any. I haven't even read um, Lord of the Flies, which actually I'm about halfway through. Greatly enjoying it. It's a very quick quick read. Um, he is a very strange, which at the moment I, would, I need to read a bit more, but at the moment I would describe it as a sort of animism, uh, a very animistic world, very alive world where things are given strange characteristics. Um, so William Golding with Tim House, which I'm actually very excited for because the, the chats that excite me the most really are the ones where I... I'm almost quite ignorant where I've sort of read one or two things and I don't really know the person, the, the, the actual thinker we're talking about, you know, outside of a couple of books that well. And then you end up getting these sort of, um, you, you end up actually getting the, 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 
the real basic answers, which is what I'm always after, the very accessible basic answers, but you also get the nuggets of wisdom and the small little bits that the other person knows. So it's always a great way to have a conversation. Um, uh, someone asks, would I make more Bernhard novel reviews? So since doing those those two Bernhard reviews, I've since read about another eight Bernhard books. And actually, uh, every year, uh, my mum always asks, you know, what do you want for your birthday? And every year it's books. And this year it's four Bernhard books. Um, so I may do a review of one of those. Uh, the, the problem with reviewing Bernhard is it would probably take quite a while because there's so much... It seems like it's all the same. I mean, it seems, in a pra pragmatic sense, each Bernhard book, barring a couple, is an outraged an outraged Bernhard, you know, pseudo-biographically inserted into the book, going on a rant for two to three hundred pages in his beautiful flow and prose. But there is so much nuance between the books that it may very well be worth it. I think if I was to do a review on one, I would probably try to do a really lengthy review, really digging into Bernhard, and it would be on the Lime Works, which s thus far... Um, thus far was uh, the best one I think and, and one of his most accomplished ones even though it was only his third um, so yeah um, someone else asked a question there uh, when was the last when was the, I won't read out the question when was the last time it's quite a while ago it's quite a while ago um some of the, I really enjoyed listening to your interview with Kevin Carson a while back. Do you still have any interest in him or C4 SS types in general? Um, I think, so with Kevin Kevin Carson, my memory was, someone asked me to do it, and I did get an interest in Kevin Carson at the time. And he's extremely encyclopedic, like this huge book, encyclopedic writer, with all this data. And outside of that, uh, the... Uh, I'm, the, the Center for a Stateless Society, this sort of... I don't know as much about C4SS. Um, it was mainly someone asked about Kevin Carson and I read his work and I was interested. Um, I still have an interest in anarchism and, and stateless ideals. Um, though, I mean, it's something I guess to talk about in terms of before I had a fair amount of libertarian sympathies. And I think over time now, I've just come to realise from conversations with many close friends that something like a state always aggrandises, and you really can't avoid that. Um, and something like some that you, even though you could say, well, the authority is a private corporation or a private consumer choice that is completely within your free agency, I probably disagree with that. Um, in a very, very practical, pragmatic sense, sure, it's your own choice. Um, but at the end of the day, the authority of a libertarian society is whoever's the best at advertising, whoever's the most convincing at advertising or whatever the private means might be. Um, and actually reading Zizek's First as Tragedy, then as, then as Fast, to paraphrase a small section from that, a very, very rough paraphrase, but he basically says, like, you know, if, and this isn't, I mean, from him, of course, it is going to be a somewhat Marxist ideal that, that I fully agree there. But um, um, his, <laughs> I'll try to get this out. His point is, if the end result, um, if the end result of capitalism is what we've got, which is just people buying masses and masses of, um, you know, crap and things being used unproductively though libertarian types would like to argue you know well who are you to say what it is to be productive if the end result is that then i'm not all that interested in it you know um so but that doesn't really mean you have to go full bore the other direction so i don't know but the just sort of centering the conversation around c4ss and kevin carson and stateless and anarchism and these kind of things. I still have a great sympathy for it, but I can't help but see that something like an authority and something like a state always will always return. There's always a, at least be some abstraction of centralization um, because it's just, uh, when, yeah, that's just the way things 
are and will be, uh, especially with systems like the internet and you know the so-called global village, which seem to spontaneously centralize things in that way. Um, and it, you know we can see this from things like cryptocurrencies, etc. That decentralization takes, you know, what someone like Kurt Jeff would call a super effort. You know, it seems like the natural inclination is to centralize, and that any of these exits and fragmentations, which of course you know exit and escape and all that, I'm all for it. But it takes this extra effort on top of the normal, which is very, very difficult to achieve. Um, thoughts on Nikolai Berdyaev? I, I might as well just say I don't. I know the name. I know another one of those ones where I know the name. Um, so uh, no thoughts there. Uh, someone says I know you're heavily continental oriented, but do you have any interest in analytic philosophy? So I have an interest in it. I have a, a compendium. The great thing about analytic philosophy is you can actually get pretty much the whole um, the whole history of analytic philosophy in a compendium because they loved papers, you know, X equals blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, uh, Here's the thing. I do have an interest in analytic philosophy, but it's it's no way near as as enjoyable to, or, or as, um, as far as I've found, uh, as natural to sort of talk about in, in terms of a conversation, you know, when you're getting into the nitty-gritty of like, Russell and set theory or what Elfrega and, and language and what you know what that all means it's just not as enjoyable as, as something that that is uh, perhaps has a has a leaning um, more towards the, the subjective or whatever that might be so I have an interest I mean I tried to get an interview on that unsung hero of analytic philosophy I can't remember his name he died very young and there was a biography written about him I would I would like to do more episodes on, on analytic philosophy. It's just how to promote uh, approach it in the in the the format that I do. I mean I don't you know I wouldn't know as well how to approach it. Um, uh, Bunny two, happy birthday, James! I want to thank you for the talk. Uh, yeah, no, I remember you. It was a great talk. Uh, lots of anti Oedipus, and I remember you actually explaining the body without organs. Uh, it's probably the only time it's ever happened. So I do remember you. Thanks very much. Um, Hey James, thanks for the content you've been getting me through mind-numbing work days for years. Do you have plans for a follow-up for your Kabbalah 101 episodes? Um, I think I do, even though it's been quite a while now. I've been reading more and more Kabbalah stuff. The difference is that the the first Kabbalah episode where you're where I was outlining just the structure of the Tree of Life is fairly straightforward across the board for all types and most correspondent systems. You might just switch some names. I don't know if the Lima might put iOS in where... Um, I don't know, someone else put some other god and then Fortune would put Christ or whoever and you can get that basic structure and then sort of move the basics around but the the three pillar structure with the ten sephira, sephiroth you know, generally stays when you get to paths uh, you know, you get to books like 777 by Crowley or um, other books about correspondences there's so much, there's so many different correspondences within one path and that one meaning that you, it, it, I just felt when I started to outline it, I was like, "This is just almost neat, like so much detail." And it was also getting into the area where I'm not too keen on talking about it, not because uh, I think there's anything wrong with talking about it, but when it, it's getting to the area of like that experience is going to be someone else, like it's going to be your own experience doing it. So maybe I should have just kept that to one. But uh, you know, it, it, uh, I may I may touch on that more with Greer, and then after that, see if. Uh, that I, I can figure out how to do that episode well. Uh, Inkalor says, if you had to add something to exiting modernity, what would it be? It's a fairly good question, to be honest. Um, I don't think about I think on exiting modernity too much. I think I would probably add, uh, um, I would honestly add a chapter about being pragmatic and trying to, trying to foresee and see, because we don't normally see this, what actual abstractions we like or we we uh, value what 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 abstractions does one personally value what i mean by that is i think a lot of people don't realize i mean i know i didn't for a long time and then you notice it's something uh, that happens a lot i didn't know for a long time that actually the thing that i valued beneath a lot of my decisions was stability um so being able to see that and then from that understanding the exit is nice and everything and doing these kind of things is, is really nice and I'm, I am in a position of sort of privilege to be able to do what I do. 
but at the same time there is something to, to be said for understanding that uh, um, that it you know the modern world is here to stay for a while I mean you know I have all the, all my sympathies for collapse but I also have my sympathies for AI uh, to be honest with you I think it's going to be a mixture of both in the future um, and I also have my mix uh, my you know I also read Spengler and I and agree with Spengler on a lot of things and in those in that sense for people who are about my age which is going to be 30 next week I would probably foresee that as long as you're um, fairly sensible with your income and things like that and you you don't overstretch your means and want to do all these super duper fancy things all the time the rest of your life is going to be roughly the same in terms of society culture collapse if you want to call it that and, and maybe not maybe not such so ai that might honestly accelerate fairly quick but um you know so then the question becomes well what if things aren't going to change all that much on some sort of uh, fun fundamental societal collapse based level for the next probably 100 years um then you know then where do you go from there and um you know modernity is here to stay for a while uh, so the, the end of exiting modernity will probably be something akin to what happens when nations start to fall which is, okay we don't really like modernity, it's clearly very corrosive in terms of whatever that abstract ide ideology is, but that's not to say you can't take from it what you you need to get 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 by right? you still have to live within it, you still have to to live close by, it's one of the points of the book, I guess it would just be re reiterating the point of the book is uh, you know any exit where you you just shoot off and ostracize yourself it, I, it's not the best way to do things um yeah um happy birthday james do you think gnomes are real um probably they probably are they probably are i did have a book where i could contact the king and the gnomes but i never did it um are you interested in the recent work Q accelerationism? So I wrote a, I wrote a piece on Q accelerationism actually in relation to Spengler. Um, so that's the the Cute Act book by Amy Ireland and uh, Maya B. Chronic, uh, recently from Urbanomic. Um, and the point of my piece was that I basically thought that actually they had given in a really great way. Uh, Though this isn't actually what I say in my piece because I relate it to Spengler and this like once again actually back to that the transition between the stages and what to do like what what to do when you realise you are of a certain epoch or you know this is like the Nietzschean decision between active and passive nihilism and I think um, cute accelerationism was really like a uh, I hate the word manifesto and I'm sure they wouldn't like me using it as well but I'll use it like a manifesto of active nihilism in a way, you know, it was a real call of how to be and what is going to be in the future to come. Um, and, you know, yeah, and, and what then the main thing I really enjoyed about it was it, it was a serious work that didn't take itself too seriously and certainly didn't boss you around. And even, even like, it made me realise that even something like Anti-Oedipus has this um, bossiness of beneath everything is still that dialogue of, like, well, I'm writing this because it is correct, it is right. Um, yeah. Have I read Gershom Shalem's Major Trends? I read. I tried to read uh, Shalem's Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism, and I, I remember not being able to get get very far into it. Oh, and that was quite a while ago. So I could retry um, and see. Um, again, the same person. Um, what's the best advice you'd give for someone in their early twenties, based on my experience? early 20s it, so a lot of people so many times people you ask, used to ask me what's your advice for doing you know studying philosophy or doing a degree right so my advice for people in their early 20s is um, is you know I don't I'm not this sort of anti I'm not anti academia I'm not anti university I'm not anti degrees but and it's once again back to a sort of a pragmatism. You can people can talk all day about whether or not there should or should not be more funding for certain things, but as far as the future is looking, there is going to be just less and less funding for for academia and for universities. It just is. I mean, it's already on the downward slope. So I would just say no. It's not not. I'm not going to say don't, 
but I would say that if you intend on taking an arts degree, be entirely sure, 99% sure that you have a, you see at least some path that you're truly inter interested in, you know, do an art degree if you want to become an art teacher or become an artist, um, take a philosophy degree if you want to become a philosophy teacher, um, etc, etc. Um, so, you know, with that said, I've like turned, there's been like two or three different times in my life where I've turned it around within the space of six months, you know. So when it's like oh, early 20s and you can get this panic, especially in our culture of comparison, you, you can turn things around very, very quickly, like within f five or six months if you if you really if you really want to and you really want to change. I mean, you have the internet and you can learn pretty much anything you want very quickly uh, from some of the best teachers there are. So I'm trying to think of, of things. I mean, you know, I wish I hadn't drunk as much i wish i'd been more honest about what actually interests me even if it was very weird or just like kind of autistic to be honest um um other things for early 20s i mean don't don't worry about don't worry about living a boring life for now because it probably will pay dividends <laughs> down the line um uh, and one thing as well, I, I think even for even younger age, but early twenties is probably the latest time to admit it is be be fine to admit that there isn't anything you really want to do within the normal scope of things. It's a big struggle for me when I was in school. It was a constant, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to be? And I never had an answer. And still to this day, I don't. You know, I was never going to say I'm going to be a philosophy podcaster. So. You know, there is just this thing of like you might you might just have to try find what you want to be. Uh, that sounds very ridiculous, but there you go. Um, happy birthday! Any chance of having Brian Monihan on author? I think I was. I so I was. I think uh, it's Thomas Monihan. I think or Monihan. But anyway, I was in contact with him a while back, and as with some guests, I just either might it's probably my fault. It just uh, I lost track of it, and it it. Um, we didn't get around to doing it so I could recontact him and chat about uh, spinal catastrophism which is something I want to want to get around to reading um hello I really liked your talk with James Maffey I yeah it's one of my favorites uh one of the favorites I've done on the podcast is with Jim Maffey he's a great guy we spoke for a, a little while afterwards he's a really really friendly guy to um to chat to and I greatly enjoyed it any other readings you'd recommend on indigenous American thought? Also, will you be speaking about any more works regarding mad studies? So one thing on the Jim, the Jim Maffey is um, he's done this talk on the ton, uh, tonal mat. I probably mispronounced that. So which is Mexican, Mexico, the ethics of Mexican philosophy and, and this kind of thing. So we're going to be talking about that. So hopefully going to be talking about it with him again. Um, as for more indigenous American thought, I'm planning, uh, as though it's been in the works for about a year now, because I do admittedly find her work quite difficult to read, um, is Leslie Marmon Silke, the author um, who writes about that kind of thing, with Nick Monk, who recorded the episode about Cormac McCarthy. Will I be speaking any more works regarding mad studies? Um, both of the people who, both of the guests who came on to chat about Mad Studies, I'd love to talk to again. Um, so hopefully, yeah. Have I done a DNA test? If yes, what are you? Um, 100% British, mate. Um, I've never done one. I don't have that much interest in, in it. Um, as far as I'm aware, Ellis is actually French. So uh, this is this doesn't mean I have any genetics from there. I don't know. As far as I'm aware, Ellis is actually from f is a French name, and most of my family are from up north. Um, but also, as with a lot of people who are from Norfolk, so one one side of my family is from Norfolk, an extremely old part of Britain. Um, so it could just be that I'm 120% English. Um, 
Who is this? Who is the cutiest patootie? I know. You know who it is. <laughs> Do you think that Chiron is different from other pessimists? These words, uh, pessimism, nihilism, antinatalism, they all get so mixed up. I think Chiron is different because it's not really philosophy, to be honest. Some of it gets close, but it's largely prose and aphoristic works. It's close. To, sometimes it's closer to poetry, uh, but I also find there's it's lived with Chiron, completely lived. Not a word of it isn't lived, and he. Um, the, I find a lot of hope in Chiron, um, and I still have yet struggle with him. I'm still yet to really, you know, pin him down. There's a lot. There's a lot there to read. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, so in the sense that he's a pessimist, he's definitely, yeah, he definitely is, but he's a tough one to crack. I haven't read it, I haven't read much Chiron in a while because Bernhard has become my, sort of my new Chiron, so, yeah. As for what I'm doing for my birthday, I'm going out for a meal, by the way. Um, any advice on reading like reading methods or anything like that I think when it comes to non-fiction I you know I'm, I don't I'm not big on speed reading but when it comes to non-fiction I don't really mind it especially with a lot of the sort of modern 350 page books where you feel like really it's mostly filler um, yeah uh, but in terms of just read, I mean, in terms of advice on reading, just make sure you put the time aside every day. And I think one thing that I've spoken about with friends recently is um, to to be reading kind of constantly. That sounds ridiculous, like not literally, but to just even if you know you're like you have 15 minutes or something, just sit down and just that's how you get through books and just always like always be reading basically and that's the way you get through things and you for me that's the way I've really learned learned to read um, I don't so much anymore sit down and really dig into a book as I used to it's a, it's a pre 30 year old game to to do that and take notes and all that um, yeah other than that I don't have too much advice do you have any thoughts on psychogeography? I've heard the term and I couldn't tell you too much about it. So I'm going to look it up and we'll see what's going on. Annual grass touching, someone says. Geographical location on the emotions and behavior of individuals. Okay. Um, you know, it's interesting. In one of Bernhard's books, he writes about Sal uh, Salzburg, um, Austria, about, you know, because it has believe Austria has the highest suicide rate and then Salzburg of any city ever has the highest suicide rate right so it's like this question of why does this you know Bernhard is sort of uh, half jokingly riffing on this idea of why you know why here and what is it to live in such a place in terms of this I've never read anything that put like specific books about psychogeography so I may be getting the meaning wrong here but I think it's uh, definitely true I mean I've got a collection of short stories coming out hopefully by next month that really are all based in Norfolk towns even though none of the towns are named and just living in Norfolk has given me a very Lynchian peculiar you know outlook on very empty sort of um, resident evil feeling outlook on things um, that you don't get elsewhere and I mean you know the idea of geographic location having um, having a psychological effect on people I mean just go to Leeds you know I mean Go to Birmingham, right? Um, <laughs> uh, what's my favourite food? Um, oh man, what isn't? Um, favourite. My favourite food. My favourite dish is pasta agli aglio e olio, which is pasta, garlic, and oil with parmesan and parsley on top. I mean, it's ridiculously bad for you because it's like a cup of olive oil. But anything. Um, it's one thing with the self-diagnosis of autism uh, one thing I didn't realise is that one autistic trait 
is that you enjoy extremes of flavors. Um, so if I eat like a basic bolognese, I sort of just taste a general savory flavor. You know, I don't get anything amazing. So I tend to over salt all my food. So like my favorite flavors are like, you know, a grapefruit or citrus or, you know, if, if the recipe calls for one head of one clove of garlic, I'll put in like a whole head or whatever. Um, so those kind of flavors, intense flavors, like sour sweets and all that kind of thing. Um, those are my favorite kind of foods. Um, anything that is going to give you acid reflux, basically. What have I learned from Bernard? I don't... That's a, that is a good question. He's, uh, he's just... I, he's real just companion. and uh, But he's a companion that holds you at arm's length. So you read him and then just go off and... But there's just something about the flow. I don't think... I mean, in terms of learning, uh, you know, especially as a writer, like... It was more like, so I guess, kind of revelatory of like, ah, oh, you can just, you know, complete overthrow of the rules. I mean, it, you describe, like yeah, I've said to people before, you describe a Bernhard book and it just shouldn't work. I mean, it's no paragraph breaks, a guy talking about the same, like literally the same thing. If you read The Cheap Eaters, uh, it's the most repetitive book I've ever read for about 130 pages and miserable and annoyed and bitter and sarcastic the whole time and yet somehow it works and the, you know that's a testament to his rhythm to his brilliance someone said forgive me if i'm mistaken but i think i remember you mentioning you worked in finance for a bit how did you transition from that into philosophy um so during one of the crypto bull runs i worked i just worked for myself again doing trading but eventually that whole thing bottomed out and uh, then uh, that was when I was studying my master's in philosophy so I, I went I did a I, I pretty much did art from school and then art in college and then did a fine art degree and then moved from the fine art degree fine art degree into a continental philosophy master's while I was doing that I was doing the finance stuff and then after that I went into marketing um, and then you know and then on and on and on um, yeah uh so and i was briefly studying a, a master's degree in economics at mites but once again the cost of living stuff just made it impossible to continue and now they've i believe they've actually shut down that master's because they were struggling for funding as well any familiarity with effective accelerationism guillaume Verdon based still so um with regard to eac I did I had a recorded an episode with Mark Andreessen on um, accelerationism and AI that that uh, you that might interest you um, about him. We mentioned effective accelerationism. Um, general thoughts on Silicon Valley optimist types adopting land. I mean, I think for me, just from being in the sphere of accelerationism for a long time, what I see them adopting is may like is is sort of a mutated form of left accelerationism. Um, so it's not so much that the AI is going to accelerate, the technology is going to accelerate for, in a Marxist sense, then be able to be utilised specifically for uh, the rise of the proletariat um, and um, the emancipation of the proletariat. But it's it's more that, like, I think for the EAC types, the, the, the emancipation is just a side effect of something much, much larger. Um, but that's where I draw the line is the just chatting about with people about this just last night actually that's where i draw the line is just before there just before like i don't agree that i don't under really understand what singularity could even singularity could even be you know this idea of um ai becoming a consciousness or whatever that might be it, it, no uh but before that the the notion of uh, for me i think the limit we will get to with ai is human beings for maybe 50 to 100 years become redundant and then eventually, you know, things will always things will go wrong like they always do. Um, so, yeah. But I, I don't know, you know, I haven't really kept up with it since then. So, yeah. Oh, and my other favourite food, which is, uh, I have to sort of slow down now I'm 30 because I get fat, is sweets. I, like, love sweets. 
And actually, one of the things I got myself for my birthday is a kilo bag of bubs, which is like a Swedish jelly sweet. They're great. What do I think about Trackle? Um, the only real time I've, in any real sense, read Trackle is via Land's dissertation. The, uh, the cultivation of the graphene uh, which is to do with Heidegger mostly and Trackle outside of that I haven't these these sort of these poets and writers that Heidegger et al refer to Holderlin being another one uh, Rimbaud is another one I never got around to them specifically um, and Rimbaud Rim, uh, Rimbaud or Rimbaud is someone I keep meaning to get around to so we'll see um, oh, Schlegel is another one I think that they constantly refer to yeah hmm. and if you know other than the questions if there's any one you'd like anyone you'd like me to do an episode about just bug it in the chat and I'll make a note of it I think the next book review is going to be. Oh, by the way, I'm going to say this. It's going to be. Uh, the Third Reich by Roberto Bolaño. Um, I managed to get. You can get this really nice slipcase hardcover edition for about $2. Um, and I. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to so that's probably going to be the next review because there's a fair amount of something there for me to dig into um someone says i've been reading too much analytic philosophy for a graduate course can you recommend any anti-analytic philosophers to annoy my professor with uh right so what <laughs> the continental analytic divide in one context makes sense in a stylistic context makes sense but in a methodological context, it doesn't. I mean, you you know, Husserl, for instance, is is emphatically on the continental side of things, um, but he is doing much the same sort of work as many analytic philosophers when you really look at it. So, anti anti analytic. I mean, it'd probably be like someone like Derrida, I guess. You know, like Derrida would be the best to go with I'd say but there's I mean ironically maybe Wittgenstein <laughs> I don't know yeah I don't know I, I you know I need to know analytic philosophy a bit better before I can um yeah before I can criticize it uh which is your favorite episode of Young Sheldon the one where it ends <laughs> a podcast on Kylo uh Michel Stetner. I have I think you referenced that person uh, him last time and I have something bookmarked which I email I did email the person and they never got back to me which is common it's not you know um, but I can't remember who it was there was there was a couple of uh, Carla Mikostetter books on Amazon which is usually like how I find most things because I just can't find them via academic publishers. Um, but the Wreckage of Philosophy by Mimo Tangani, or I think was who I emailed and, and didn't get a reply back. Um, yeah. Any chance of another land interview? I don't. I don't know if anyone knows where land is at the moment. Uh, we did. We recorded. We tried to record one. So we tried to record one like years ago now and uh, it was around Christmas time. It was going to be on horror and uh, all we recorded was like one sentence when I asked Nick if he enjoyed Christmas and he said he did and then the connection cut out. <laughs> I still have that clip somewhere. Um, and at one point, and Greer was completely up for this but then Nick never replied at one point because... John Michael Greer and Land 
are born in the same year and they've sort of you know gone in separate paths so i wanted to organize you know the the great bearded druid and the uh the shaven the shaven singularity right and then have them have them chat it chat away and talk about it um but i don't think nick never replied so maybe i'll try i'll retry when nick gets back to twitter or whatever an esoteric June review for clicks. So I liked the film. I liked the first part of June, uh, even though at times it was a little bit flat. Um, but I'm not keen on the book. I've never made it through the book. I've read the first third about three times, and then I just, I just dip out. I just can't. I just find it really it's kind of dull, to be honest. Um, it's one of those one of those greats that that you just think, okay, I'm just don't get it. I mean, the ultimate. For me, the ultimate book of greatness that I don't think is very good at all is uh, Siddhartha. I just uh, that and Nightwood by Juno Barnes, but Siddhartha, I just was like, this is just terrible. This is the most boring thing I've ever read. So I like the idea of June. I like this world, but um, uh, yeah, where I can read about Younger and Chiron relation. Um. I don't know if I've, outside of like small articles and posts, I don't know if I've read any extensive treatment of that, at least not in English. There probably is in, I imagine there definitely is in the younger uh, collected works, which is huge. Um, but I haven't, I haven't read anything in English. I, from one of the things I know about that was that Chiron, I think it was this way around, Chiron tried to get younger into certain authors and he just wasn't that interested, but... The one picture of them together, they've clearly had a few, a few beverages. Mm. Um, I'm yeah. I mean, movie reviews is kind of tempting, but it's not as I wouldn't have the the, the thing there with me to talk about. So I'd have, to, and also one of the things about like doing a review of something is you end you. You do have to you have to uh, consume it differently. You have, you have to take notes as you go along. Think about how you might talk about it. How you you know what's important, and it, it does. It doesn't necessarily spoil it, but it changes the experience of it. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, if there's any other questions or anything else that people would like to see from the podcast, uh, yeah, please let me know. I'm trying to think of anything else that's coming up. Um, <laughs> how do I reconcile my cult views with my pessimism? Um, well, I think all, all, uh, well, maybe not all. That's that's a stretch but I think you know I think to say that all spirituality is inherently optimistic would be wrong I, th I think there's there's a lot of uh, pessimism uh, in spirituality uh, yeah I, I don't know I don't think they, they don't they don't think they need to be reconciled you can be a believer who's pessimistic and about the world at least um, yeah, uh, there has been a Jack Parsons episode with the author of uh, Strange Angel, the book. Um, though, this, though I do think the series is pretty good, to be fair. Uh, happy birthday! Thanks for your work. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll be thirty. Three zero. They say that your thirties are your best years. Do more episodes with Tom McGowan. Your conversations with him are always so interesting. So many people say that their my chats with Todd are their favourites, uh, and I'd love to, but it, it, you know I don't want to keep bothering Todd. You know that's the, that's the thing. So I, I do I do it when he has new books. It's uh, it's the easiest way. Um, yeah, but it, no, I always have great a lot of fun with McGowan. He's a great guy. K 
Can you get the Spengler guy back on for a What to Do episode? Uh, actually, so... Um, so... Re re uh, I'm just trying to... So, uh, yeah, David Engels, um, the Spengler guest, he's also... I'm not sure if he'd consider himself a Tolkien scholar. I think last time we spoke, he said, you know, he just has a extremely deep interest in Tolkien and reads Tolkien every day. Um, so um, I, I may contact him soon about the possibility for a, you know, a Tolkien episode, maybe a Tolkien episode from a Spenglerian point of view, because the Lord of the Rings is an extremely, maybe not extremely, but it's a very, very Spenglerian book. You know, the you can see the cycles that have already died. You you are in this sort of cyclic history of different uh, different apocalypses and different eras. So I may contact him very soon about that. Do I still consider myself a believing Catholic? Uh, at the start of this, I was talking about my spiritual journey, and uh, there's a book book coming out that I wrote for A on an introduction to spiritual introduction to Christianity, really focusing on the spiritual path of Christianity, which is what I found lacking. And the problem, this notion of like, do you still consider yourself X? As, or do, so do you still consider yourself a Catholic as if everywhere you go, Catholicism is exactly the same? And it's one of the big problems is that Catholicism is way more decentralized than people think. I mean, it's not, it doesn't, on a day-to-day -day basis, has pretty much nothing to do with the Pope as far as my experience went um and you know it's going to differ from parish to parish from priest to priest so it's very it is a difficult thing to uh, to really get into but in, ter in terms of the believing i mean it's that's that's a struggle it comes and goes and it's up and down and i integrate it with other things that um that other other things and experiences that of that i have of of, of life i know that sounds like a bit of a cop out but um it's uh yeah and you know it's a journey it, it goes forward and it's tough and has its ups and downs uh have i considered an episode with or on john crow crowley is he uh i think i know who that is is he the guy who wrote little yeah he wrote little big i quite enjoyed little big but i don't i don't know if i fully got it it was a while back because i know that little big is Ran Prieur's favorite book. That's uh, that's what one of the reasons I got it. It's Ran had a list of books that he really enjoyed, and Little Big was on there, and it stood out. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, but um, yeah, maybe I'll contact him and look into that. But uh, there's a. I'm just trying to think of, of other things that I've sort of. So one of the one of the things is a lot of the authors that I'm uh, that I've become interested in. Like so, for instance, like Bolaño. It, it's uh, it'd be difficult to get a B Robert, Roberto Bologna scholar because it's just so recent. I mean, with Bernhard, it was tough enough. Um, scholarship takes a while to sort of solidify, and even then, it takes a long time to find. Um, you know, um, academic publishers don't. You know, so much of it is very, very hidden away. Um, so that, it makes things tough. Um, one I would like to see, I did email him a while back, but he has a new book coming out in June or July, would be Ray Kurzweil, just for the up, you know, the update of the AI. We've been talking about AI, but the AI singularity. Um, yeah, other than that, um, hmm. Yeah. Conversation with Parker set case let me have a look I will bookmark that and look into it um, yeah if there's any more questions or comments or things like that let me know um, did I receive a free copy read Paul Bishop's book I read the book uh, of Discourses of Philology and Theology in Nietzsche, uh, because, you know, we chat about it. Uh, I received a digital digital copy. Um, I usually 
Sometimes I get sent physical copies, um, but it's usually usually a digital one. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the problems with academic publishers is it's library priced, you know, for libraries to buy, which doesn't make any sense to me, I know. Uh, it's not a comment on anyone, it's my own comment on things, but um, uh, yeah, to, I mean, it's, it's the norm across academia, really, of just how they're priced. Usually, though, if you wait a year, a few months, six months or so, they, they release a paperback version. So it might just be a case of playing the waiting game. Um, yeah. Confession time. Have I ever pirated PDFs? No. Have I considered doing an episode on with Federico? So I was meant to be doing an episode with Federico Campagna. And I... It was on... And I'd even sent off the questions. So it was on. Hang on. It was on um, Prophetic Culture, uh, his book that. So I think it would have been about 2022. And I'd, we'd, he'd agreed to do it, and then I formulated the questions to then go fully organise the date, and he didn't get back to me. So I, I may hit that up and. Uh, Try to do it. What happened to Zap for Part Two? Uh, Zap for the Zap for Part Two fell through, and that was my uh, my fault because um, we'd agreed on this date to record, and then I was ill at the time, and then uh, then she went on holiday, and then by the time by the time we'd come back, I you know it was like they were different headspace. So yeah, it's unfortunate, but it is kind of my my fault. Um, yeah. Um, but Campania, I will look into again. John Crowley, I'll look into again. And then we'll see. I mean, I'd like to try do more and zap for. I don't know if On the Tragic, because I heard that On the Tragic had been uh, translated and was ready to. close to being ready to launch. But. Um, yeah. If 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 we could get the translator of that, then maybe it'd be another Zap for episode. There's a lot more there in Zap for to 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 chat about, definitely. Well, um, oh, he seems to have disappeared from public view. Okay. Do I play any instruments? Um, no. And I'm not, it's, I'm not, there's two things, I'm not, you know, not that I'm amazing at anything really, but there's two things in life that I just can't do, which is geography, like knowing where I, where things are on a map. I can, I can, I can read maps, like for walking very well, but in terms of general geography, knowing where countries are, uh, spatial location, you know, that I can't do. And the other one is like rhythm um, and, in, and instruments are just... Uh, it doesn't work. So no, I don't. I don't play any. Um, but yeah, unless there's any more questions, uh, this has been good fun. Um, and thanks for all your well wishes and thanks for supporting. Um, and yeah, thanks for all the support. Thanks for listening. Keep listening. There's always going to be more. And um, yeah. Thanks for coming along. I'll give it a couple of minutes if anyone's got any more questions. Uh, yeah, I've got Mindlander's translation. So translator doesn't want to do an episode because I think he's uh, he's just done with Mindlander which is completely understandable um, it's not really so I've read a fair I've read about half of it um, the, so it's volume one of the philosophy of redemption and I um, no, I don't think it's a very sort of talk friendly philosophy in a way it's because it's fairly straightforward and it's a bit, 
it's a bit so I don't know it's almost dry I don't I'll think about it because people love the Mindlander content because there's not much of it out there um, I'd love and think also it would be popular a 30 minute -ish, 30 minute ish video on lands theory so one thing I would like to do in time is actually to do like a free just not necessarily a course but like a I don't know a five or eight part intro to land taking I'd outline I'd start at some point outlining like key the key essays in Bang New Menor and then maybe one talk on thirst for annihilation and go through and then end up at the theory of capitalism um yeah well we'll see um but yeah i'm gonna go make my dinner so thank you all very much. thank you all very much for your questions and well wishes and uh as always thanks for the support <laughs>